Let me clarify, I'm not buying above the median that should be or the median that will be when the market corrects itself. I'm not gonna play the median based on what it is for the next five years. People, like I'm just telling you right now, there will be people making millions left and right in real estate and there will be people getting spanked. Literally someone says, hey Chris, I got $200,000 in equity in my home, 401k IRA, I wanna partner with you. Could we turn that into a million dollars in five years? I would be lying if I said no. That possibility is very, very, very real. But the longer you leave real estate in, the bigger that it gets. All right, Chris. Oh. I met with our acquisitions team last week, and there's some crazy stuff happening in Florida. Do the market, it is just going up and up and up, and it's bidding wars everywhere. Some markets worse than others. Talk to me about the median home price, because this is a statistic we use. This is a metric we use to determine the health of pretty much the real estate economy in America. When I buy real estate, I always buy below the median. What's the median? So, th you know what? It, this is not totally technically true, but it's, it's, it's something everyone can understand. Think of it as the average price that people can afford or tend to purchase. Okay. Right? Like last year, the, the, the median was 250000 then it went up to 285,000 and then it went up to $350,000. And that was all within 2020. Yeah. Does that normally happen? No, Chris? no, no, no. I mean, real estate prices move over the last 65 years, 4.58% increase per year. So a $200,000 home with a 5% increase, that would be $10,000. So a $200,000 home might become $210,000. A $250,000 home might become $262,000. So you're going to see, you know, that median home price number should be moving eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year, not $70,000, right? So for anybody that had already purchased properties, this was an amazing year. Oh, for dude, if you, if you bought at the, like a year ago in yeah. the game of real estate, you're freaking feeling like a ninja. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so smart. I am so glad I bought that house. Look at that, $70,000 worth of equity. I don't make $70,000 a year. It was like I got double income, right? So there's a lot of people feeling really smart. But by the way, there's also the people out there that were thinking of buying and they didn't. didn't. That's and you know what they're thinking ask. right now? Oh, it's like a kick in the teeth. I was gonna ask you, did you buy homes a year ago? <laughs> Dude, I, was, I buy homes like almost every day. So yes. But the reason why I'm buying, like listen, most of the market functions on confidence, which means that when people are feeling really confident, we buy a lot. When people are scared, when there's fear running rampant, when there's a, for example, if the stock market takes a dip, all of a sudden everyone says, hold on tight, don't do anything, hang on to your wallet because if this goes really, really south, you're gonna wish that you had some money in the bank. And, and so what's interesting about that is that when people perceive the market's doing well, they buy. When people mm -hmm. perceive the market's doing bad, they hold on. Well, a real investor is counter cyclical. When people aren't buying, they're buying, I'm buying like crazy. And when everyone and when everyone's selling, I'm also buying. But when everyone's buying, that's usually when I'm also selling. So I'm always in the market. I'm always playing. I don't function on consumer confidence like most people do. So what do you function on? Math, statistics, ROI. Like literally, it's a simple game. Wealthy people know how to put their money to work. And most people don't know how to put their money to work. That's indicative of our, our overuse of 401ks, um, IRAs. Uh, these are the slowest vehicles that we deem safe. And yet you look at the compounding effect of the money in those accounts for 30 or 40 years. And then you wind up in most cases with 10 to 15% of what you need for retirement. So an entire working life accumulates five, 10, 15, maybe in some rare cases, 20% of what someone needs, meaning a, an, a volume of money that could be annuitized and actually keep their same standard of living. So when people get to retirement, what they end up doing is they end up consuming their savings instead of living off of the interest of their savings. The goal is to not touch the principal. People haven't been taught that. There's a couple of basic math equations that everyone should be taught. And I know that today we're gonna to be talking about predictions for real estate for the next five years, also for 2021, 2022, 2023. Uh, I'm gonna be sharing some statistics, statistics and information that honestly uh, should receive a healthy dose of skepticism. People are gonna say, Chris, you've gotta be kidding me. You can't honestly think that's what's gonna happen to the real estate market, but I'm telling you right now, I'm spending money every single day as if that's exactly what's gonna happen. And I'm telling you right now, that's what's going to happen. So we've seen home prices jump in, I mean, across the country. Yeah. 
And a lot of people are wondering, is this the start of a bubble forming? Yeah. So let's actually talk about a bubble for a minute. So the, the term real estate bubble essentially means, uh-oh, prices are going up higher than they should. And those prices have to come down. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways of thinking about a bubble. I always ask this question, what is the cost of building a home? And if you want to know what that is on a property, like one maybe that you own right now, you should just ask, what is the insurance company requiring me to insure this property for? Because here's all they, they don't care what your home is worth. They care that if the house burns down, they have to that they it. can replace it. Because guess what? And that's called replacement cost. So you have um, this whole idea that, let's say that the replacement cost on a house is $300,000, but that same house is selling for $400,000. I'm going to tell you right now, you're in a bubble a bubble by the tune of $100,000 because it costs 300,000 to build that house today. It's selling for $400,000 and any time the value of something appreciates higher than its replacement value, you are in a bubble and all bubbles burst. So so wait a second though, what happened in 2020? Isn't that the formation of a bubble? Because these houses, they, they don't cost more to replace just because of COVID. Okay, so this is interesting. We are definitely in the beginning formation of a bubble. So it's and not it's not just are we in a bubble. The, the other question and the more important part of the question is when will the bubble burst? And right. that's what I want to focus on. That's what I want to teach every one of you listening is I want to help you understand that, listen, no one, the smartest people in the world, the, Warren Buffett can't predict when the market is going to go up and down. Like nobody can. We know that every seven years it, we're going to take a bath. We know that it always takes an average of 36 months before we get back to where we were at before. So the smartest people, what they're doing is they're actually basing their financial investment choices for the most part on actuaries, on data, on trends, on historical figures. In real estate, however, it, it's opposite. It's almost Sesame Street stupid. It's a game of supply and demand. You have, listen, you only have three things that will, that will affect demand, meaning people wanting homes. It's population, people have sex, they make babies, and those babies need a place to live, right? So you've got that. Then you also have migration. Where are people moving to? Like, are people immigrating from another country? Are people inside a country migrating to it? Like, old people migrate to Florida. They love the weather. They love the price of real estate, how affordable it is. Most golf courses in the country right there, so that's migration. But then on top of that, you know, you look at those two market forces, and then you look at the economic factor of businesses that are moving to areas and how many workers they're going to attract. Trying that jobs. also affects migration. So overall, it's all of the people in an area when that number spikes, they're going to need more houses. And what that does is that controls this whole notion of demand. How many homes are we demanding being built? But the other market force is supply. Builders producing new homes, trying to keep up with what that supply looks like. Normally, there is a healthy relationship between supply and demand. And usually every 15 years or so, we end up getting to a phase where we have built more houses than we actually need. And I'll tell you exactly how that works, because I think this is important for people to understand. Uh, 2008, everyone remembers, right? What happened 2008, we had this, this massive bubble burst and the market forces behind that bubble bursting were banks having a massive supply of money, wanting to put it to work, and they were giving away these heartbeat loans. It was the subprime bubble crisis. Basically, if, if you could breathe and fog a mirror, they were gonna give you a mortgage. So banks were giving mortgages to everyone and it wasn't your typical 20% down payment. Sometimes it was 10%, sometimes it was a 5% down payment, but when it reached its all time insanity, they were literally saying, we'll give you 100% financing, not on a home, that's normally three to 5% down, 100% financing on an investment property that they should be requiring that 20% down. And we were, and, and so everyone was basically building homes, everyone was spec building. And what we did is we created this glut in the market of supply, all of these homes. But you know what, eventually, it, you know, it takes a long time to plan out a development, right? It has years worth of phases. And, and it can take two or three or four years for a bubble to burst once it starts forming. And the reason why is because people are saying, I need this house. Oh my 
gosh, the prices are going up. If I were to spec build a home, meaning speculate and build a home, assuming that there's a body that's gonna be able to buy it, then if that home goes up $50,000 this year, that's another 50,000 I'm gonna make on top of my normal whatever building costs and charges. So all of a sudden, people start chasing the values because they start saying real estate is an extraordinary store of value right now. Not its typical 5% appreciation year, it's appreciating 10%, 20%. So everyone becomes an investor. And by the way, when skeptics decide to jump in the game and start buying, you know that the cycle has ended because they are trained to get spanked over and over and over again in life and they're the last ones to get spanked again and then guess what happens? Too many homes, not enough buyers, and guess what a home is really worth? What someone's willing to pay. And when no one is willing to pay, guess what happens to the value? they can drop extraordinarily 50%, 60%. That's what happened in 2008. I went into Phoenix and Vegas where we had the, the largest gluts, where we had more homes produced and bought than we had people for. And those $350,000 homes went back to the banks and they were selling them at auction to me for 120, 100,000, sometimes $80,000. Within five years of building no homes after 2008, those homes went up to 140, 150, 180, 200. At 200, I got out, sold everything. My investors cleared over $100 million in gains on properties that were sold or that they kept and held on to. So supply and demand. I mean, this is all built around people wanting homes. What are we at right now? Because well, you said a bubble's forming. Homes are valued higher than they, they have been before. All right, but so, so, so I got to tell you, this, this, this bubble is extraordinarily different. I think that when we look back on the entire century, this will be probably the most fascinating case study of the century. For example, in the previous century, most fascinating case study, Great Depression. Great Depression, the stock market, Black Friday, everything went down 70, 80, 90%. And Think about consumer confidence. Everyone is terrified about what's happening in the market. Everyone's everyone's doing a run on the bank. Everyone's trying to hold on to their money. But guess what happened the decade after the Great Depression? That you have, you have families like the Rockefellers that make their name. Um, the worst of times for people with money is always the best of times. So for me, do I have like a massive chunk of money waiting for the next stock market drop? so that when it drops 30%, I'm gonna go and buy a whole bunch of companies that I believe in as a futurist? Yeah. And is that money literally just waiting for the market to drop? Yes, that's what's happening. Well, compare that to the real estate market. We never recovered from 2008. After 2008, we went seven years before we got back into building mode again because that's how bad the bubble was. We had so much supply of homes that it took seven years for us to finish cleaning the books and getting them all off and get rid of all the foreclosures before we basically said, huh, it's worse. People have moved in with each other to save money. So all of a sudden, seven years after, prices start returning back to normal and they start approaching rebuild value. That's how you know you're in the slump. This is the opposite of the bubble is, wait a second, it cost $250,000 to build this home, but the home next door of the same size is selling for $200,000, so guess what? They can't build. You can't build a $250,000 home for $200,000, so guess what you have to do? Wait for the prices to return to what? To rebuild value. Well, we never recovered from 2008. We left 2008 with, um, we, we were missing 400,000 homes. Next quarter, 500,000, 700,000. So you're saying missing because there's people. Because that we have demand right now. We, have, we have demand. Right now, right now in this country, pre COVID, we had demand for 1.4 million homes, according to Freddie Mac. 1.4 million. That is the largest supply issue that we've ever had. Hence, and it's still an echo running. from 2008 that we COVID, have the COVID 19 hits, and now we have a 2 million demand for homes that currently don't exist. Why? Because people are selling and they're moving and they want different homes. They want homes that can accommodate work life and home life because they assume that the effects of this COVID-19 thing are going to linger and that they're going to, in a post-pandemic world, continue being able to work from home. Like 70 something percent statistically are hoping that we won't go back to that part of the normals. Like I, I like working from home, but guess what? I need a different home environment. So now we've got a demand for 2 million homes and we can't solve that demand for the next four or five years. And because that number is so big, guess what it's doing to prices in Q4 of last year? It freaking Sky jacked rocking. up the median $70,000. Carson, you just had a home sale. Yes. How far above asking price? Uh, $60,000 $60, above asking. $60,000 in 24 hours, how many offers did you get? Uh, we had 20. 
20 offers in 24 hours and you had an all cash offer all cash offer we at $60,000 above the asking price. Yep. People think these are extraordinary times. They're like, oh no, a bubble's forming. Don't buy real estate. I'm like, listen, I want to tell you something. The real estate market, if we engage every builder and get them to build as rapidly as they can, even though prices of lumber freaking just doubled, guess what? I don't think we can catch up to the 2 million mark in five years. And guess what that means? That means that if the bubble is forming, this bubble is here to stay and it's here to inflate and it's going to get bigger and it's going to get bigger and it's going to get bigger. And we always talk about inflation being bad. I love inflation. I think inflation is amazing. If you keep all your money in a bank, sure, inflation is horrible. But if you own assets that appreciate, if you own real estate, there's nothing better that could ever happen to you financially than like crazy, massive, astronomical inflation. And that's what you're going to see year over year for the next few years until we resolve that 2 million deficit in missing homes. So by the way, a bubble will build, but when will the bubble burst? We have to, dis we have to satisfy demand. Once demand is satisfied, then we will build what we no longer need. And every home that gets built in this country after supply, after demand has been satisfied, is going to be some of the riskiest money you could possibly put in real estate. Hence, I don't buy over the median. And even, even with that being said, I'm usually 30 or 40% below the median. That is most certainly true right now. And I'm gonna tell you why. Real estate over the last 65 years has gone up an average of 5% year over year over year. Well, guess what happens? You're, you're gonna say, well, Chris, how big of a bubble are we gonna form and how much is it gonna burst by? I think that in this century, this may end up being the biggest bubble because of extraordinary market forces of record low interest rates that we haven't seen for 50 years, record high supply, uh, record high demand and record low supply. Those three market forces will take, I believe, no less than five years to work themselves out. No bubble can burst until we fix that, which means that could the median go from 350 to 400? Could it in the next two or three years go to 450 or 500? Could it go to 600? All of those things right now with these extraordinary circumstances, all of that's possible. But when the bubble bursts, will a $600,000 home go back to what it's what it should have been on track for, meaning, you know, assuming our 65 year average of a 5% gain and what the real medium was, was 250, maybe correcting back to a 300 or 310. Yeah. Could you see a $600,000 house drop to 300,000? Yeah. And that's gonna be a bloody day in the market. And there's people that are going to get hurt. You know, who's going to get hurt? Someone who bought their house for 600, someone who bought their house for 500 and someone who bought their house for 400, someone who bought their house for $300,000 might actually be at a break even which is why I'm buying up as much real estate, single family home as I possibly, it's, it's, it's the hottest real estate sector right now that you'll see for the next decade. And I'm buying as much as I can, but my typical, my average purchase price is under $200,000. I'm gonna ride this wave. I'm gonna clear, I believe, one, like hundreds of thousands of dollars per property. I know when to sell, I know how to time that. And then when the market falls apart, guess what I'm gonna do? It's gonna be a foreclosure fiesta. We're gonna, guess who's gonna clean up the economy? Investors. So even though the home prices are so high, you're not advising your investors to, to just sell right now. And you're not advising them to halt on buying well, new I am buying. No, 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 no. My, my investors and I are buying as much real estate as we possibly can right now. And this now. is because you think, and give me a timeline on this. And I, and I know you're not a Great, prophet. here's my crystal ball. Yes. Let me, let me yes. tell you exactly what will happen. Mark my you, words. No, what do you think <laughs> is going to happen? Give me a timeline, 2021. All right. Median so, home price goes to what? Okay, I think this is a little unfair, but you know what? I'll play your game. Okay, play my game. And just know, caveat, that Chris is just calling it like he sees it. He's not a prophet. He's not got um, a crystal ball. I, I think financially, I think that we're going to see forty to $80,000 price hikes every year as long as the bubble is forming, which means that each year until that bubble is satisfied, we could see forty to $80,000 increases. So... You do the math. What's 50,000 over five years? That's 600 grand. Chris, you told me something recently. You said- I, just, I told you some people are gonna like, like, oh, pull that snippet and post that and call that guy an idiot. Chris Crone thinks that the yeah. median home price on single family homes will hit 600,000 in the next five years. I'm like, well, I also think Bitcoin is probably gonna hit a quarter million and, and it's gonna keep soaring over the next 20 years. I bought a lot of that too. <laughs> Jeez.
going to be an interesting time. Yeah. Chris, you told me you sold a house in Florida and then instantly regretted it. And that was like, what, a month ago? Oh my gosh. Why yes. do you regret that? You Home know, prices so are so high. I, I, I partner with people in real estate all over the world. And when I partner with people, I believe in a 50-50 partnership which means that I give voice to my partners. Um, they have my cell phone, we connect with each other, we communicate, them, me, my team. And um, every once in a while, very, very small percentage of my partners gets into a situation, it, it could be a divorce, it could be a, uh, it could be a sudden change in philosophy where all of a sudden they feel like it's in their best interest or something comes up where they need to sell the properties prematurely before they're supposed to. And every time it happens, I make a phone call, I'm like, don't do it. I promise you, this is you're gonna regret this. I would say that anytime, but right now, like I mean it 10 times more. Why? Dude, I, I buy real estate where my average ROI, I'm clearing 30% of your on my money. I, if, if it doesn't produce 25% of your, I'm not interested, but you know what's gonna happen in this market? If my predictions are correct, that means that my ROIs will likely be double, triple, quadruple, or more than I'm currently betting on, as in, if you buy a piece of property and a 20% down payment is let's say $50,000, right? Like I'm buying a $220,000 home. I got to put between closing costs and 20% down. Let's say it's $50,000. But also let's in theory say that, you know, remember I'm used to making 25% a year of my money. What's 25% of 50,000 in that year? That's 12.5, that's 12 grand, right? That's not like, that's very doable. I, I, I can get my real estate to perform and optimize my cash flow and my tax benefits, it's great. But let's just say that the property, we're going up $50,000 each year for five years and you put 50 grand in. That's 100% return each year on your money for five years in a row. That means that 50 grand on one property potentially over five years turns into $250,000. That means that, listen, I, I tell Carson, listen, drop 50 grand in, you put up the money, I'll do all the work. I got my team of experts in the best markets, we'll buy the home. And if we can just take that 50 grand and double it every five years. Five years later, we turn 50 into 100 grand. And now we can go and sell that one house and buy two. I can take the 100 grand and turn it into four, 200 grand, sell those two houses and go buy four. Take four, buy eight, take eight. 16 properties over 20 years with the full compounding effect of a minimum of a 25% ROI, you're looking at taking 50 grand and turning it potentially into $4.3 million. And on a 50-50 relationship, you know, clearing the profits after you know money gets paid back to the investor, we're just making a couple million dollars. It's a good deal. I got partners lining up. Right now I have too many people that want partners versus the number of deals that I have access to. And so if a partner says, hey, Chris, let's buy five properties. Are we looking at over 20 years, turning that into $20 million? Yeah, but you know what's really cool about the next five years? Accelerates. We're accelerating. We're not looking at a 20 year game plan. We're looking at a 10 year game plan, a seven year game plan. Um, we're just moving so much faster right now. If you knew that you could make 100% a year on your money, oh my gosh, like who wouldn't want to buy real estate? But you see, here's how idiots play the game. Chase the market, which means, oh my gosh, the, you know, the median is 360,000 and this year went up to 410,000. Let's go buy a $410,000 house and maybe it'll be worth 460 the next year. Well, you know what? That person can win the game. I just don't like the way they're playing it. I don't, when I say I don't buy above the median, I'm, I, that me, let me clarify, I'm not buying above the median that should be or the median that will be when the market corrects itself. I'm not gonna play the median based on what it is for the next five years. People, the, like I'm just telling you right now, there will be people making millions left and right in real estate and there will be people getting spanked. Literally someone says, hey Chris, I got $200,000 in equity in my home, 401k IRA, I wanna partner with you. Could we turn that into a million dollars in five years? I would be lying if I said no. That possibility is very, very, very real. But the longer you leave real estate in, the bigger that it gets. So we have extraordinary timing right now in the market, and I'm being more careful than ever before on the partners that I select because everyone's an instant millionaire. Everyone's an instant winner when they're playing this game with me right now. As long as they're not short-term, hey, hurry and fix and flip and make a quick buck, it's like, no, 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 no. Like This is about real, sustainable financial freedom, and you couldn't ask for a better real estate market in the next five years. Chris, what you're saying is true, and the market does do these things that you're predicting it would be a shame for you to not bring on as many partners as possible and help them do this. I'm trying. How can someone out there who's interested in doing this with you, how can they, how can they get involved? You know, so I got people that will go to, um, you know, if, if you go to chriscrone.com and spell it right with double K's, K-R-I-S, 
K-R-O-H-N. If you go to chriscrohn.com forward slash, you know, partnering, there's a link there where you can learn about, you know, there's some videos and some trainings and tutorials and talk to members of my team. Reality is I'm looking for a couple things. I mean, obviously someone has to have disposable money, 401ks, IRAs, um, equities, e even money that might have tax consequences, qualified funds. I can maneuver out of that without paying taxes and penalties. You know, they, they have to have money that you can put in and it's good to be thinking 50, 60 K per project. And so, you know, I've got a variety of ways of partnering with people. You know, some people have millions, right? Um, but it's really, uh, it, it's, it, it's a two-step um, education process. And then it comes to my table for verification. And ultimately my team is not just looking for someone with money, but someone that has the right temperament. We're looking for someone that has the right energy, the right attitude, and someone that's trainable because every year I put on a partner event, I train my partners how to think like winners because most people aren't, most people can't handle making a million bucks. It, 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 their psyche won't allow that. So there's a, there's ways for people to get educated and learn about it. I, I think Carson, What's more important is people should ask, well, Chris, what happens when the market downturns? What will you do? Well, we're always strategically entering and exiting the market. And um, when the bubble bursts, I think that not only will this be one of the biggest bubbles of the century, I also believe that it'll be one of the worst bubble poppings of the century. I think it'll be akin to, I mean, what would you call it when, when real estate loses 50% of its value at a median home price level? Listen, it's one thing for a market crash to take a million dollar house and a million dollar home and, and cut it in half to 500,000 or everyone would suspect a $3 million home could become a $1.2 million house. But what about when your average typical American house loses half of its value? If people aren't properly positioned, it's going to be devastating and people are gonna feel over leveraged. They're going to be upside down. Their homes are gonna go back to the bank. We're gonna see a huge spike in people returning back to renting. And that, that, that bubble, that size of bursting will probably take five to seven years to clean up. And that house that someone paid $600,000 for, I'll get it from the bank for probably 200, 180. And I'm going to make that house available to the person that couldn't afford 600, but they can't afford 200. And I'll help them buy it. So, you know, investors, if you do it the right way, we're, we're always a part of the solution. We're always part of the, clean, I call it cleanup crew, you know, which is someone's got to clean up this mess. The government's job is not to clean up this mess. Uh, although I, I do feel like with all the free money we're printing, we are enabling um, a lot of this rapid, you know, these problems that we're seeing right now. Uh, you know, part of it is just, hey, we need more money. We don't have to generate it, just create it. That's why we have this hyperinflation problem. You shut down the world, you shut down the economy because of the pandemic. And you know, this isn't to get into the right and wrong of how we should have or what we could have, we're here. And based on the choices that we're making, when we need more money, we print it. Well, let me tell you something I've learned about businesses that when they need money, they print it or they go crowdfund. They cannot sustain themselves long-term and bankruptcy is an inevitability in most situations. So I think that we need to get our act together. I think we need to support natural GDP in the country. And I think we need to support businesses and we got to support the local economy as best we possibly can and say, hey, you got to figure out how to, we got to cut programs and figure out how to get on our own feet without needing to print money because look at the devastation. Everyone just keeps printing money. They call it financial easement. That's a fun, fancy word for, we just, we just print money when we need it. And that's why the dollar is such a poor store of value that if you keep your dollars in the bank, you're going to feel poor every single year. If you put it in an asset, like real estate, the appreciation is going to make you feel rich. So Chris, are you saying that the $2 trillion stimulus plan from Biden is not sustainable? I'm saying that as long as we hamper our own ability to produce our own revenue, our country's GDP, and we just keep printing more money, that's one of the reasons why we will see this hyperinflation. Are you also saying that shutting down the economy hampers our ability to produce GDP. Gee, all I can tell you right now, I just read an article that said they got 4 million people vaccinated. It was a record number in a day. And I'm like, great, listen, hopefully a few months from now when we get most of the rest of the everyone vaccinated, I'm not even gonna tell you whether like my personal feelings on vaccination, I don't wanna go there because my feelings are like- Controversial? They're controversial, they're very, very strong. Uh, but th the whole idea at least is that if everyone gets quote unquote vaccinated, then everyone can feel better about opening up the economy and letting things flow again. And honestly, that's what I want. I want us to get back to some semblance of normal where people can feel greater job security um, and, and, and where people can take care of business. Because I, I think that a lot of people have had their cheese moved on them. Yep, definitely. So, uh, 
in 2020, there are a number of, uh, you know, some of our peers on YouTube, on social media, influencers that talk about real estate predicted a crash in 2020. Yep. Um, meet Kevin, Ken McElroy. They've all got videos on the crash of 2020. And it was all predicated on this idea that there was going to be a massive wave of defaults on rental. So people not being able to afford their rent and having yeah, yeah. to be evicted. So, so let me let me share with you a couple of things that are happening government policy, right? Biden yeah. is basically saying part of that two trillion stimulus bill is the government will pay your rent for you if you can't pay it. Now, this is something Trump didn't do. So part of me loves and hates what this is because I feel like the government is now starting to take responsibility. They're saying, hey, we're telling you, you that you're work. not allowed to evict these people, but we're also telling you that if they legitimately can't pay, we will make sure that you get paid. I, Which makes sense because... The, the eviction moratorium, yeah. they said you couldn't evict people, yep. but then they also said the economy needed to be shut down so yes. people couldn't work. So the, really, in this of, equation, the landlord gets screwed. I got one of my businesses screwed. bathing in its own blood, choking to death because it can't operate because the government's local and federal keep saying no. Yeah. So... Do you, do you foresee a problem with this? Okay, in so let's, let's actually address that. Will so, there be a massive wave of eviction? So you have to ask yourself something. Look at Biden, look at his character, look at his platform, and look at how the Democrats own the House right now. Do you think the Democrats have it in their heart to say, all right, everybody, we're removing you know, the foreclosure moratorium, and now all of a sudden, if people don't pay their mortgage, banks, you can foreclose on all of them. If you believe that they're capable of doing that, then that will be an added market force that could prematurely affect and drop prices temporarily. We're talking 2 million missing homes. And so while some people are worried about that, I'm going to be honest, I think it's a chink. I think that it is a small market force. Um, one, because I just don't think that the government is going to do that. I think that we have entered an age of entitlement where the government can no longer backpedal from certain choices that it has made. It will have to reintroduce foreclosures so that banks don't go out of business, right? Yeah. The government can't pay everybody's bills. We got to return to some kind of normal. But if you look at it, we started with losing 40 million jobs. Now we're down to 10 million jobs. And with those 30 million jobs that have been regained by people, that has I think removed a lot of the, you know, that looming risk that has been addressed mm -hmm. by a lot of my peers. Okay. Let's pivot a little bit. Um, are you willing to share some secret information, Chris? I'm always willing to share secret information. <laughs> let's see if I can get it out of you. All right. Um, where are you buying right now? And then I want to know what markets you're looking at going to next. All right. So I have traditionally been buying in Florida but those prices are soaring right now. Um, I was buying in the 160 to 180, up to maybe $200,000 range. I'm finding that that market is continuing to move. Memphis was another market that I was buying in. Um, but right now, inventory is getting harder and harder to get my hands on because people are paying over appraised price. By the way, I am not opposed as an investor to paying money over appraised value because I understand the market forces, the price points and what's happening. And to some extent, your performer has to take those things into consideration and make determination on really what this is ultimately about. People get caught up on strategy and they get caught up on nuances when they should never lose sight of the ROI. ROI tells the entire story. So factor everything in and then you make your decisions based on ROI. That's how a professional does it. Um, but from lacking inventory and from some increased competition, um, we opened up Greensboro, South Carolina. That's been a fantastic market. I've been able to buy homes in the sub $200,000 price range. But frankly, um, I've got two or three other markets that I have my eye on right now. I won't disclose what those markets are You're not specifically. not going to tell us? No, but listen, I just told you that freaking opened up South Carolina. That's yeah, one that's, of the top 10 tracked markets in the economy. And, and people might be wondering, well, Chris, how do you determine, like, what factors do you look at? You see, mom and pop shop investors are always looking at, like, the deal. You never start at the deal. You always start with the market. Um, I used to just buy in my backyard. And when I did things like lease options, like I talk about my straight path real estate book, dude, you can, you can find deals with 25% annual ROIs in your backyard if you're leveraging that strategy, but it's not a scalable strategy. So ultimately I ended up going nationwide. And when I went nationwide, I had to learn how to evaluate the 324 different markets. And one, th one of the, you can probably guess it, the number one market force that I first look at is population mm -hmm. migration. I want to know how many people are moving there. By the way, also the economy, what businesses are moving there? Um, what is the, you know, what is the demand for job growth in that market? But then I have to juxtapose that to affordability. 
In other words, I'm not gonna go to San Diego where the median home price is 600 grand. I've gotta stay under what the national median should be. The national median should not be 340,000. The national median should at most be $275,000. So I'm buying 30 to 40% below that. I need to be buying sub $200,000 houses. And you probably know that over the next two or three or four years, those houses in those markets are gonna become scarcer, scarcer, and scarcer. Uh -huh. So I have to expand far more rapidly into the most intelligent markets that have um, um, a, a really good balance between tons of people moving there, migrating there, population booming there, um, strong uh, economic forces, businesses moving there, strong job market, but then the affordability at that magic price point, well under $200,000. And if I can find the nice, nicer, newer neighborhoods in markets like that, that's part of the reason why I have really low eviction rates where why my renters pay their their you know these these are people that make sixty seventy thousand dollars a year that are renting a basic three bedroom two bathroom home they could afford twice as much home and so I don't have a problem in these nicer neighborhoods that I'm in these newer neighborhoods uh, because that's actually part of the strategy right because there's there's a floor as well while yeah. you're buying below the median you're also not buying like yep. in Detroit like yep. you didn't. 2010. You mean when I lost my shorts and yeah. like I, I, I bought real estate at a 94% discount and only lost a million dollars selling off those 186 homes. Thanks Painful. Carson. Painful. Thank you for, for those lovely memories. Okay. You said you're looking at three areas. Can you tell us one of them? No, I would love to, man. Um, but I, here, here's what I'll tell you. The soonest, as soon as I, as soon as I open a market officially, you know, it costs 50 to a hundred thousand dollars to do the research, bring in a team, establish boots on the ground and get the relationships in place. Cause some mm -hmm. of the team is my people and some of the team is contracted out to locals in the area. Like I got to find, for example, the right property management company, the right rehab teams. Uh, uh, you know, there's a number of things that make a very complicated machine like this work to maintain the standards of high ROI that I go for. Fast forward, 2025. 2025. What's the market looking like in your eyes? What's your prediction? Yeah, so um, I will probably, when I, when I foresee, what is I track this 2 million number, uh, which by the way, I think some of that is phantom because people would like to have a house that is, is better for a post-pandemic world, but that is not a need to have when we have these kind of supply and demand problems. So I suspect that that number will shrink back to 1.6 or 1.5 million. Um, as we approach three to $400,000 of, of inventory, demand, um, that is probably when I'm going to be selling off most of my real estate. And that is, that is probably, that's, uh, that's going to be easily within a 12 or 18 month window before you probably have some type of bubble burst. I'm probably going to start my liquidation process one or two years prior to that. Trust me, we'll have cashed in and made like stupid, amazing gains. You know, and then I diversify in the commercial arena, you know, me and Dolph DeRoos, Dolph's been in the game for 40 years. He is one of the most tactically sharp, sophisticated commercial investors, I think literally on this planet. And he and I are teamed up on other projects. So I believe that there will be a funky plot hole for a couple of years in the game, a single family where I'm going to be in a little bit more of a waiting moratorium. Uh, but that doesn't mean we won't be busy making just crazy, stupid amounts of money. So you're saying you think that, that, uh, that pause on your investing, you think 2025 by then it'll have happened. I think that we've got five years to clear out that 2 million. If we are moving as fast as humanly possible, it could be seven years. You think there'll be another curveball along the way like COVID that kind of shook everything up? Uh, I think that once you introduce a new market force, it is likely to reappear. And it's just a function of, of pattern. Um, you know, when it comes to the game of money, when, if something happens, you know, there's this thing that everyone quotes, this whole Murphy's law, there's Murphy over there. It's like, if it can happen, it will happen. Well, once something does happen the first time, here's what we've now introduced. If we find a, a flu or a virus that has mortality rates somewhere around what we saw with COVID-19, guess what? The yep. world's going to shut down again. Yep. So my guess is we have created a, a new response to how we, how we handle situations like that. The frequency of when that'll happen again, I have no idea. Okay, Chris. So when someone comes on board and they do partner with you, what is that actually like? like the details of it, what does, what does that actually look like? 
Yeah, you know, so partnering is literally some of my, like one of my favorite business activities that I do because I, I, my partners love me and I love them. They love that I have a billion dollar real estate track record. They love that I've done this 5,000 times. They love that I am playing at a sophisticated enough level that I've learned how to juice real estate to produce those really high double digit ROIs. Um, and for me, an ideal partner, someone that also understands this is a little bit of a longer game. This is not a get rich quick play. Um, but you know, anyone that starts building a portfolio with one, two, three, four, five homes that you put on track to double, that usually opens up other doors of playing with me. Cause I've got way more aggressive ways of making money than just even this passive approach to real estate. So, so, you know, people find me on social media, they'll check me out. They'll look at my track record and they'll say, you know, I, I got some money, not in my bank account, but you know what? Chris said something about 401ks and IRAs or home equity. If you have a home right now, you have home equity. Everyone's equity rich right now. Everyone could literally probably partner with me. It's just a matter of whether you're, you're literally looking at getting into the investing game and also whether we're a fit for each other. Because I have really high standards, not just in, in, in my real estate, but expectations for my partners. So when, when someone partners with me, they, they've got to go through a process of, uh, basically it's a two-step qualification process. Number one, they're going to talk to an introductory level member of my team that will just say, hey, do you pass the sniff check? Like, here's a couple of videos on what partnering is and how it works on that website that Chris talked about. And um, like, you got to have money set aside. You got to be committed. You can't be a tire kicker. Like Chris is only working with serious people that realize that they've probably wasted too much time financially and they need to get ahead of the game. So when I have someone who's motivated, someone that has gone through my education process, then they actually get to my senior partner enrollment specialist. This is a member of my team that I've spent time with and I've trained on exactly the temperament and character I'm looking for in a person that I want to partner with. I'm looking for someone that understands this is a longer term game and also someone that's not going to freaking wet their pants the moment a property is like unrented for two months. Like average vacancy right now, three weeks. Could it be three months? Yeah. Are we going to prepare for that? Yes. We put a, I call it a sleep well at night account aside. We're going to put money in the bank and we're, we prepare for worst case scenarios, but I need someone that can stomach that. I need someone that can rely on my expertise and my team's expertise. Um, so if I find someone with the right temperament, someone's got the assets and it looks like more or less they understand the, the whole process of how we partner. It's like, okay, Chris, we're going to be in this together 50, 50. You're going to create an LLC. That's an entity that we own together 50, 50. Your lawyers are going to put that together. Um, basically I'm the financial partner putting up the money as the financial partner, Chris, you're, you're, you're the sweat equity partner. That's basically putting up the team to do all of the work. You're going to research the markets. You're going to find the properties. You're going to negotiate, find them, rehab them, get them rented out, manage them, and then help me find the strategic time to exit the market and then re-enter with more real estate. And we're planning on doing this for an extended period of time. The goal is to make millions of dollars. The goal isn't to make a half a million dollars. The goal isn't to make $200,000. Every five years you're in this game, your numbers, they exponentially increase. So when I find someone that's a really good fit, you know, um, and they understand, you know, that there's, it's a business, there's fees, and, and they're gonna put down payments. When they understand the whole game and they're ready to come and play, my team will decide whether they're going to invite them aboard. If they do, they're going to immediately get them to my real estate division of my, of, of my assistants. They're going to put them on a group thread with me, with my private cell phone. And then I'm going to make an introductory video. I'm going to say, hi, we're going to connect. I'm going to invite them to come to our, our annual meeting because I want to press the flesh. I want to meet them face to face. I want to see the whites in their eyes. I want to connect with them because they're going to be my partner for a long time. Uh, we're going to build a lot of a lot of wealth together. So I, there's some training that I want to give them. Um, but beyond that, we immediately get into, okay, Chris, like, how are we going to buy this first deal? I'm going to educate you on the markets and the options. And uh, once you understand the markets, there's really only a couple of major options. We're either going to go to a bank and we're going to do a 20% down payment. We're just going to go and do it, you know, put that 20% traditional down, or we're going to leverage my private real estate fund. And, and I have to have a fund, right? I mean, I've got partners who can't use their credit or maybe they're self-employed and, and, and because of tax reasons can't, you know, you know, sign on a personal loan. Like banks are weird to work with. Things get complicated. Some of my partners are international. So I have a fund that works basically the same way, but sidesteps around personal credit and banking. So we basically isolate which strategy is best and then boom, we immediately go to work. And in this economy, you go to work fast. Like if you come in and you're like, kid, I'm planning on buying five houses. I got quarter million, 300,000 set aside. I want to buy five homes. We're not going to do that over two years. 
We're not gonna do that over nine months. If the bank says you can buy three at a time, we're buying three at a time. If you're gonna use the fund, we're gonna go and buy all five through the fund right now. And uh, dude, we're, we, the most important thing, like every single day that you could be in the market that you're not, is a day you should regret, because I can put a number to that that is big enough to make you sleep at night and go to bed sick. And that's what most people don't understand. But once you get the math, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, time is of the essence. I think I can use that phrase for the first time in my life and really get what that means. It is freaking go time in the real estate arena. So in other words, deploy the money, you know, as fast as my partner feels comfortable with, buy the assets, get them rented out, and then, you know, we settle in for the ride. So a couple points of clarification. Um, the type of individual you want to partner with. These are not uh, skeptics. No, 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 no. Skeptics can buy my books. They can do my training courses and they can go invest all on their loans themselves. Like, like it's, 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 it's you. I learned a long time ago that um, there's, there's two types of people. There's dumb people and smart people. And I'm not talking about intelligence. I'm talking about decisions because there are smart decisions in life and there are dumb decisions in life. Most of us have been trained. We don't even know it. We've been trained to be lone wolves. We've mm -hmm. been trained to go it alone. We've been trained that you read a book and you get knowledge and then you go out there and you try to figure it out. Problem is, is that most things in life require more than one hat of expertise. And Malcolm Gladwell says to become an expert of anything you need 10,000 hours. Hard. Well, listen, for you to become an expert of rehab and managing rehabs and proper pricings and negotiatings or finding the right kind of market or finding the right kind of deal or lining up the right kind of lending, that is like already right then and there, that is enough level of expertise that for the average person, they're probably going to accidentally make bad choices. And in real estate, you need to make a hundred choices the right way. And if you mess up on just a handful of them, that's enough to screw everything up. So, you know, I think that, you know, people should always find a mentor. I did not build my portfolio on my own. I had someone watching my six. I had someone reviewing my numbers. I had someone giving me advice. I had someone supplying me contracts. I had someone showing me how to do it because they came from a space of experience, not theory. They had actually done it before. So dumb people, or rather I should just say, people who make dumb decisions are those that try to go it alone. And in many situations, they're not gonna execute it anywhere near to the fullest of its potential. And that's just called a lesson, like you get to learn. Um, I used to do that in the beginning. I was one of those, you know, people, right? Like God-given, precious, priceless human beings making dumb choices that then later learned that if you're going to get in something, you should be all or nothing. I play every game in my life like my life is on the line, which means that I only settle for the very best. Like if someone said, I want to play the game of single family the way Chris Crone does, here's what I would tell you to do. Go make a list of the top five people currently actively investing in single family that are doing the most volume and that are making the most money. And those people learn from them. You should go hack everything they've learned. Because listen, I've only been in the game for what, 18 years? I've done a billion dollars worth, 5,000 deals. Guess what I've learned? I've learned so much about this space that there's nothing new to learn for the last several years. In this particular game, a single family for producing that double digit ROI, I am not learning anything new. And that's because there's nothing new to learn because I've learned it all. And I would almost call anyone arrogant that ever would say I've learned everything on a, on a particular topic. Guess what? I'm training with Dolph Roos and commercial. I'm expanding my horizons. I'm doing some multifamily. I'm playing in some other arenas, but guess what? On single family, the way I do it, my niche, yeah, I have mastered that game down to the dotting the final I and crossing the final T. So when someone comes and plays with me, guess what they're really doing? They're stepping in at the end of the learning curve and they're gonna reap the highest level of benefit. So any game I play in life, guess what I'm always asking? Who's the very best that I can afford? And that's the person I wanna play with. Okay, so you've got a person that fits this description, not a skeptic. Um assets they got to be able to come and play right what do you what's a figure you'd be willing to throw out i know home prices vary and you know i always tell people that right now there's two there's two pieces of advice that you may have heard before maybe not so it's worth sharing number one you've got to save no less than 20 percent of the money you make everyone should be actively saving 20 percent of what they make whether you make minimum wage or whether you're making three hundred thousand dollars a year um because i'm going to tell you right now there are, there are people that make $40,000 a year that are millionaires, and there are people that make $400,000 a year that live check to check. 
So the, the difference between the two people is one saves and one doesn't. Now it's not just saving. The whole purpose of setting the 20% aside is not so you can have a, a buffer yeah, for financial peace, sleep well, and I, so you can freaking invest. It's so you can get in the game. Most people are not in the game. You need to get in the game. And to do that, it takes money to make money. So everyone should be saving 20%. However, I have a second rule. Most people haven't heard this one, which is whatever your 20% figure is, it needs to be no less than $50,000 a year. Wait a second, Chris. I make $50,000 a year. How am I supposed to save $50,000 a year? Yep, you're right. You have a problem. You need a second job or a hustle or a something on the side to figure out how to pop out an extra $50,000. Because if, if your 20% of 50 grand is 10 grand a year, 10 grand is not meaningful enough to get in the game. You, sure, you can become a multimillionaire with that with time. But if you are a serious player, you're like, no, 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 no. Chris, I want financial freedom in the next five, seven, 10 years, or maybe in just a handful of years, not in decades. I want to like live my life while I'm young or I'm in my prime. Then you should be saving $50,000 a year minimally. And people are like, well, how do you do that? Well, I have a business where I give people side hustles. Reasonable businesses that take one or two hours a day that are fully capable of delivering two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a month. Guess what that is? That's your extra fifty thousand dollars a year. Why fifty? Because fifty thousand dollars is a down payment on a piece of property. So I'm taking the circuitous route to really get to the answer to your question, which is how much money does someone really need to play the game? So generally it's the 20% down, plus I like to have what I call a sleep well at night account, which is how much operating capital do I need in the business's bank account of this LLC that we create so that we can feel good? And I always tell people, aside from the 20% down on a property, you know, you should be looking at $10,000 in the account on property one and five grand on every property after. So someone says, Chris, I wanna buy five homes then I would say, great, you should have 10,000 on the first property, plus five, plus five, plus five, plus five, that's $30,000. Wait, 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 Chris, why do I have $30,000 sitting in my account? Like I get, you know, 6,000 deposit every month from rents. My mortgages cost 4,800, there's 1,200 left over. Like why $30,000? I say, you know what, you're right. It seems like a little bit too much. But let me tell you something I know about you. If you're new to the game of real estate and if you're a new investor, the moment you have two properties that are unrented at the same time and you do this math, well, I'm paying my own mortgage and then I've got these other two mortgages to pay, it triggers a freak out response for a new investor because their worst fantasy is being realized. Oh no, they have these liabilities and these debts and they're not producing for me, so I freak out. And when you have $30,000 in the bank, I found that's enough where people don't have to freak out anymore. But also, you know what? Tenants, they happen. And sometimes there's five or $10,000 bill that comes up that was unexpected. Guess what? You got to cover that. That $30,000 in the bank on those five properties is to help you sleep well at night. So, so, you know, to answer your question, depending on the markets after we educate my partners, you know, down payments, you're going to, you're looking at 50, $60,000 per property. Um, and I, here's the one thing I tell people that they're not really aware of. I got some people that have money in like 401ks and IRAs and they're like, well, Chris, if I take that money out, I'll pay taxes and penalties. I got money in an annuity. I, I'm going to pay tax and penalty if I take that money out. And I'm like, well, you could actually self-direct that 401k or that IRA, which means pull it out of the market, but keep it in the vehicle. And then you can put it in my real estate fund. And what does that do? That actually takes qualified money. No, you don't have to pay the tax and penalty. Although I'll always run the analysis because there are situations where you're, there's like more than half the time it makes sense to pay your tax and penalties today and then grow your money inside of real estate because guess what we can keep doing? Deferring capital gains and taxes by 1031 exchanges, refinances. These are non-taxable events where I can access money and go buy more. So the goal is to build the real estate portfolio and at some point you're like, well, aren't I ever gonna liquidate it? Why? Why would you want a million or $5 million sitting in a bank account? Oh, uh, sleep, safety. safety. No, you don't need that. But you know what you're going to want? That portfolio is cash flow. So you're going to keep it in real estate. And then guess what? You're never going to have to pay taxes on the cash flow because the depreciation is always greater on these single family homes at that price point, you know, than the, than the cash flow. Okay. Last question on that. All right. Credit. You kind of address this a little bit. I'd love to hit it with more clarity. Do your partners need to have good credit? You know, we've been trained that that your credit is an asset. And you know what? It is. But the question is, what is the value of that asset? You see, I almost never use my credit for 
anything. And yet, why do we value this, this thing? Well, I like to have good credit. It means that I'm, I pay all my bills and I'm good with all of my creditors if I, if I owe anyone any money. Um, so yeah, you can use your, your credit to go buy 10, 20 homes with the variety of banks that we use. But I think that's the default thinking. I use a fund to bypass that because I can actually show people how to make more money by bypassing the bank system by not using the bank. And so my, my, my partners are given an option. If they're international um, and we're gonna struggle to get a mortgage in the States, if my partners have um, a credit glitch, it could be bad credit or it could be unusable credit. In any of those situations, that's where I just default to my fund which just allows us to basically do the same thing. It's an inverse of the same strategy. I'm buying the home's cash, then I'm going back to the banks and I'm doing asset-based lending that doesn't require a person's personal credit. We can borrow 60% of the money, drop it back in real estate, we can keep on going. So by the way, if you ever consult with your credit report on whether you can invest in real estate or not, I would say that's a very, very limited decision very limited thought notion. Uh, if you're ever consulting your pocketbook on whether you should invest in real estate, that's also super limiting. I mean, I basically turned $3,300 into $1.6 million when I became financially free originally the first time. So there's always a workaround for anyone that's listening that says, Chris, I don't got $50,000, $60,000 to put, you know, put in a property and partner with you. Dude, that's okay. There's still ways for you to get in the game. Go to chriscrone.com, check them out, and I'll show you all sorts of ways of building wealth. Some of them are even still partnering with me as a zero cash partner. Literally go, go find people that I want to partner with, and if they partner with me, I'll cut you in on the deal. Like, There's a way to get in the game of real estate. It comes down to desire and motivation, not know-how. For a lot of people, Chris, they're gonna wanna look and say, do you have some success stories you can share with, with your partners? Is there yeah. anyone that comes to mind that's just killing it? Dude, I, like all of my partners are killing it, man. Like, I, I will tell you that I got this one. Like, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna first answer that question in an opposite approach. All right, I got one partner that was like, you, you know, they were, they were, they sent me a freak out message. They're like, oh man, you know, the the the, the property taxes went up on this property, and I'm really nervous. And I'm like, uh, you got to come out to my old, you know, my my annual event so I can fix that mindset because it is broken. You're not broken. Your mindset is very trashed right now. And, um, you know, this, this individual almost every other month reaches out and I'm like, in hindsight, that's not someone I would have wanted to partner with, but I'm with them right now and I'm educating this individual and they're figuring it out. So, you know, I have one partner like that. The rest of my partners, freaking happy go lucky couldn't be more thrilled about what's happening in the real estate market this is this is insane time he's like oh, i got my buddy paul i was going to drop his his last name i'm like oh chris permission buddy you know paul's paul's about 10 properties with me like these properties are skyrocketing through the roof right now um i got you know it's, 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 there's so many partners that come to mind right now where listen i think happy they're happy, number one, because they're partnered with me and they're relying on my expertise and where I'm buying and my, you know, I've spent millions of dollars cultivating and building the system. But they're also happy because they're, we're crushing it in real estate. You know, they'd be happy if we were producing 25, 28, 30% returns, but right now we're doing way better than that. And that's gonna keep happening. So, you know, um, you know, if you go to chriscrone.com, check out all of my gear, you know, I, I, all of my websites are littered with my partner's success. Um, there's no question about that. Awesome. On April 13th, you are doing something special that you've never done before. We're putting on a little training for people who are interested in this topic that we've hit pretty extensively today yep. on partnering. Um, so I just want to shout out, uh, go to chriscrone.com forward slash huge real estate returns. chriscrone.com forward slash huge real estate returns. And that's April 13th yeah, no, at I'm gonna, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Yeah, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I'm going to take a couple of hours and just fully educate people on all of the nitty gritty details on where I buy, how I buy, how I'm doing it. Um, I will find some new partners that way, but people will walk away with an extensive new knowledge base of what they should be doing right now to capture the profits for the next five years. Hands down the best time of the century we're going to see in real estate. That's my prediction. Final words, Chris, what would you say to anybody out there who's on the edge and is like, oh, should I get into real estate right now? The world is so crazy right now. Don't chase the real estate market. Be strategic and be intelligent. Make decisions as if the bubble has already burst. Produce your calculations off of that uh, and be smart about it. Get a mentor somewhere 
to watch your back, someone with track record that has already navigated downturns. 2008 was the worst downturn we had seen since the Great Depression. Um, they called it, you know, the, the Great Recession. And, um, you know, so I, I think it's important for people to get a mentor. But if you're not playing the game of real estate, then, I'm, then that, and you do have money, you're going to lose because inflation is going to eat your money up. It is going to literally eat your money. It is going to feel, you're going to feel like you lost years of value off of the life of your money. And yet if you put it in real estate, you're going to have the opposite experience. You're going to feel like you skipped years and maybe decades of, of gains. One last plug, April 13th, head over to chriscrone.com forward slash huge real estate returns. Chris, if there's one thing I know about you, you always seem to win, 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 no matter what. It's just like that song. Uh, so if anybody's wanting to get into real estate, partnering is one of the fastest ways to start getting a portfolio going. You know, it, it looks like I'm winning all the time, but the reality, that's just because I was such a good loser for so many years. I lost so often. I got my butt handed me over and over again. And you know what? Anyone that becomes really successful, usually what we all share in common is we just stayed in the game long enough to get past, uh, you know, past our war wounds and to let those, those scars heal with vital lessons that now guide us in our choices today. And the reason why I'm winning is because I've lost so much in the past. Now I'm winning way more than I've ever lost. And it's fun to help take people on the journey with me and to help them succeed and, and learn from all of my mistakes and literally just start at the top of the mountain.